Grazie a tutti. Uh, I'm sorry I'm speaking in English. Uh, I urgently feel a uh, tremendous obligation uh, to Isabella to Isabella and to Jazz, Jazz, Jasmine. Uh, they, they did everything to get this organized. Um, Cesare, I thank you very much for doing what you have to do. And uh, you've all got to admire the, uh, the room you're sitting in. I mean, I, I, it's the first time I've been in it, and I, I used to think a lot and write a lot, and uh, like anybody who studies modernism, I used to think about shock and uh, what are the psychological, cultural effects of shock and, you know, you early 20th century painting and so on. I, uh, I will begin with a couple of quotations. I'll try and spin a little bit of general ideas, which have probably seem very general and abstract, which is boring, uh, but th that's how it worked out. Um, I'm going to speak slower because there's a translator there and it's, you know, it's very difficult. <laughs> I'm speaking too fast. So if I sound like a zombie, you'll know it's for a good reason. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of uh, passages that I wrote. Now, you should know that I worked uh, working uh, something like 40 years 50 years, I hate, I hate the, hate that, <laughs> uh, as an anthropologist, cultural anthropologist, uh, and cultural anthropology for me must mean field work. If, you, if it's, that's what makes anthropology incredibly interesting, magic, both fun and boring, and it makes it different to every other discipline in a university. So I was thinking, what if you adopted a field-working uh, attitude towards the end of the world, towards uh, what I call global meltdown? And I had this little, I found this little passage. Uh, what happens if the field worker participates in the weather whispering prehistory into things, prehistory into things, as poetry in the present, prehistory into things, as poetry <clears throat> in the present, when the sub-freezing temperature shot up yesterday to early spring warmth, the snow started to melt like a blowtorch had been put to it and the mist rose from the river like a shroud, enveloping all that lay around. We walked in the mountains close to the sunset with the streams running high, stripping off our clothes. At times we spooked ourselves, disappearing into the mist like the phantoms we were. Same as happens in certain sunsets when the light turns everything purple with shots of yellow and blue raining like vapor from the far off ridge where the sun sets. The craziest thing was that every few minutes we would walk through a pocket of hot air and then a few minutes later we would walk through <coughs> chill. And the craziest thing was that as with immersion in the mist, so you sensed this mimetic, mimetic pull into a rampant otherness of being in a torrent of imminent destruction. Tornadoes were reported further south. As was yesterday, one of those days of utter perfection, early fall, it seemed like we were living in, a, in glass, the world not real, but a picture in which we held our breath.
We are now becoming like the soothsayers, the wizards of old, the fortune tellers of old with global meltdown. We are now becoming like ancient stargazers, each night asking the heavens, why, wherefore. We sense our animal selves, our plant selves, our, <clears throat> our insect selves, all of that and more as an angry sky beats down, like in Rome the last week, beats down, our bodies resonant with unknown liaison as foreign beings skid in from the unknown. Suddenly we are alive in our bodies as to stellar influences, the influences of the stars and solar wind when all goes dark once more but for the fireflies, epitome of the newly, newly, newly animate world, reminders of chances missed, others to catch, roadside flares of pixelated consciousness. Now these two passages I pick out of something I've been working on for a while called uh, Mastery of Non-Mastery in the Age of Meltdown. I guess these passages are trying to convey a sense of a new body, a new human body, without our knowing, slowly, slowly, slowly being brought into a different relationship with animals and plants and insects and the sea and the stars and so on. A new sense of bodies being connected to other bodies and to what I call the body of the world. So this prose, this very carefully <laughs> embroidered prose, is a sort of a poetic attempt to make that register. Now, uh, let me find my sermon. I have a thesis. Yay! I don't usually have an argument or a thesis. Um, it won't... Uh, I don't think you'll like it very much. Um, the thesis says that with melt, what I call meltdown, which I see as a political meltdown and an environmental meltdown, and I see the two working together. The White House, on the one hand, an environmental death on the other. I see them as mimetically embracing each other. When I talk about walking in the mountains and it going from hot to cold, it's winter one minute, it's spring the next, you're walking through steaming snow melting, you take off your clothes, it's so hot, then suddenly it's cold again. This tempestuousness this tempestuousness is exactly the same sort of tempestuousness that I see coming from the bad shaman in the White House. It's really remarkable to me, this mimetic engagement between today's politics, the wildness of the weather, and the wildness of what's happening in the US, and plenty of places that are copying or like the US, but they don't have that same power. Second part of this thesis goes that with meltdown, forgive me, there's an amplification, a magnification of what I call uh, a mimetic faculty. Mimetic faculty, like when a kid is a wind A kid is a doctor, or a kid is this, or a kid is that. A magical ritual 
is, revolves on sympathetic magic. You could call that mimetic magic, if you like. You could just think of mimesis, the mimetic faculty. Benjamin puts it this way in an essay, famous essay, since written in 1932 or 33 in Ibiza. He says that nature consists of similarities, but we don't see it anymore. But there were epistemologies, ontologies, blah, blah, in which people were very, very acute, very, very alert to seeing similarity between this color and something else, like a tomato, and living inside a tomato. You worked on that pretty hard in your imagination and talking to your friends. Nature consists of similarities, he says, but the greatest similarity, the greatest ability to see similarities is human beings. So he calls this the ability to mimic something. Plants have it, insects famously have it, butterflies famously have it, but human beings really have it. Even rocks have it, but human beings really have it. This mimetic faculty. There's great desire this love of becoming something else. It's imaginary. It has good politics, it has bad politics. But this yearning to become other, he says, is very, very, very strong. So it's my strange idea that with meltdown, this capacity, this facility is marvelously increased and it's a thing of great, for us it should be a thing of great joy in the midst of horror and it's maybe something that we could turn to our own purpose to make a better world. The Marxist, Freudian, Nietzscheans, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, writing about the Third Reich in 1945 in a book called uh, Dialectic of Enlightenment in English, Dialectic auf Aufklärung, uh, say, well, guess what? History of the world, history of the world, is the domination of nature. F finish. <laughs> oh, it sounds so simple. Domination of nature from the beginning of the first Adam and Eve, the beginning of the first Greeks, the beginning of the first Australian Aborigines, whatever, has always consisted of this desire to dominate nature, and that includes women, animals, and as a man, dominating yourself. It's a bad situation, and they have a lot to say about it. So I've been thinking about the environment, environmental critique, and so forth, and I thought two things. Uh, the domination of nature is successful to the degree in which nature is mimicked. And I, I think the invention of the wheel and the invention of to the atom bomb always require this ability to be able to copy something in nature and then deflect it. I like the example of the, um, the wing of a bird and an aeroplane. Such a simple analogy. And all of you here are flying all the time thanks to that bird wing. But here's the question. What does the bird get in return? Mastery of non-mastery would be an attempt to see that the bird gets what it's worth. The mutuality between entities would come to the ledger, would come to the fore. I see this uh, augmentation of what the mimetic faculty leading to the mastery of non-mastery as the opposite 
as the answer or something, response anyway, to the domination of nature, domination of nature, mastery of non-mastery. I see this as operating through three uh, channels. Tomorrow there'll probably be four or five. Uh, the first one I call the re-enchantment of nature. I think this was, a, to me, this was a, a renovation. I mean, I never thought of the current bad situation we're in, environmentally and politically, in terms of enchantment, let alone re-enchantment. But I thought it was so catastrophic and so weird, <laughs> so vibratory, that it required a new thought form, like a religion, but not a religion. Like enchantment, but not enchantment, re-enchantment, and it's full of evil, I thought. I know I sound like a preacher. But most of us, when we think of sacred things, don't think of nasty shit. So I follow, that's, that's, hell is a lot more interesting and important. Evil is a lot more interesting and important than heaven. And this re-enchantment of nature is a negative, negative sacred. I don't know if you ever read Bataille. The second, co the second component that helped me think of some of this was what I call dark surrealism. I always thought of surrealism as a lot of fun. People talk about Freud, the subconscious, Andre Breton and all that. Uh, but I thought, what surrealists uh, worked on the macabre and, and the horrible? It was like in my mind, and I'm not an art historian, surrealism was on the fun side of things and the, 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 the bad stuff had no space for surrealism. But I thought today, to coin a phrase, is surreal, but it's surreal in this deeply... Uh, bad, negative, w sacred sense. The th I wanted to, I was talking today upstairs, I, I was thinking the closest I can get to it is uh, Hieronymus Bosch and the worlds that he painted. It's full of my third category, which is uh, the metamorphic sublime, you know, like, you hear of Kant's sublime and Edmund Burke's sublime. Something that is something that's beyond words. It's it's leaves you spellbound. Some usually some thing in nature, but it could be literature. It could be any medium. It's sublime. Is it religious? Not really. But it sounds awfully close. It's beyond words. So on and so forth. So I was thinking of uh, uh, Hieronymus Bosch's, uh, uh, most of his paintings, uh, as involving cascade, as involving tumultuous objects, people, animals, plants, insects, rivers, becoming something else, and that something else becoming something else, and that becoming something else. So metamorphosis. Animals, plants, human beings. Uh, the paintings are full, the objects, the people are full of rupture, dislocation. They're hybrids, they form hybrids very easily. Men, women, men, animals, men, snakes, men, fish. The fishes are ruptured, the stomachs are exposed. And there's the weirdest form of uh, sexual activities that goes on, all within three panels. That's the sort of uh, uh, surrealism I was thinking of, and that's the sort of metamorphic sublime. So that's the, that's the dry bit of the talk. People will say, well, what's this all about? Uh, so what? And I, I was thinking that it all adds up to... Um, 
propaganda on my part uh, to make us more sensitive to becoming my medically sensuous beings with insects, with the ocean, with the sun, etc., etc. I would love to see this mimetic faculty enhanced, and that would mean relationship between persons and things, persons and animals, etc., etc., uh, in a way that involves reciprocity and mutuality. I think that's what it all adds up to. Um, in, I probably <clears throat> now. I wanted to talk a tiny bit about my friend Simran Gill, uh, whom you see in this photograph. This is in an oil palm plantation in Malaysia near a place called Port Dixon. And she's holding a bunch of oil palm uh, nuts in her belly. And she's made herself into a, into a palm tree. So if we could lift the screen. That's Simran. Uh, this is a martini glass. I and it's full of palm oil. And this is Paramilitaries. So this is Simran Gill, and this is what I'm going to call art. And this is chemistry, which is this is chemistry, which is like alchemy. So many things can be made from palm oil. The first one is diesel oil, diesel fuel, especially in, the, in Europe. This is metamorphic sublime. These seeds become like that in the photographs of the um, brochure that I work from in Colombia. Big, beautiful, very, very expensive book put out by the owners of the, oil, of the palm oil plantations. Now, the palm oil plantations are spreading everywhere in the moist tropics, and it's the number one crop. It's like sugar was to slavery, sugar was to the colonial period, palm oil is the same today. The paramilitaries, their job is to get, kill and clear off the peasants. This was sort of worthless land, too wet, you know, only tough, poor people would have gone there to make a, a small living. But now it's suddenly that the palm oil, it's all become very uh, sought after land. The paramilitaries are. Um, what Deleuze and Guattari call the war machine. The war machine is not just a bunch of soldiers. The war machine is part of the state, but also against the state. It's on the fringe of legality, like the CIA, say. You get it? It's not just a bunch of tough guys with machine guns. And they use power saws, actually, uh, to uh, cut up people while they're still alive. That's their weapon. The war machine is also ghostly. It works through invisibility. So we could call it, too, as part of a metamorphic sublime. Okay. Now, this word art 
is really the key word because you can see this is an artist doing her thing, but is this not art too? Isn't chemistry, which comes from the word alchemy, which comes from Egypt, Egyptian magic, three, 4,000 years ago, it has its art too, but the real art for me is the connection here, bringing, bringing them together. I described the um, I tried to define my medic faculty, but if you look at Simran, she calls this, or I call it, becoming palm. Becoming palm. This is to me is a beautiful example of the mimetic faculty. You remember when I did this thing? The child becoming the windmill. Well, he's, he's the artist living next door to an oil palm plantation, by the way, uh, becoming palm. And I thought it might be, uh, if I can find it, uh, Flow Bear 23, must be here. No? Oh, yeah. I was thinking about Flow Bear's book. Uh, Gustave Flaubert's book on the temptation of Saint Anthony, the hermit, who lived in a cave in Egypt 2,000 years ago. Hieronymus Bosch has a painting of Saint Anthony, by the way, which fits everything I've been saying. In the book, Flaubert describes Saint Anthony Tempted by the devil, remember the devil is the great imitator. The devil is the prince of the mimetic faculty. Flaubert describes a world given over to what I call mimetic relays. So we could put it like this. So these are like what I call mimetic relays which is basically metamorphic, uh, sublime. Things become other things, become other things. Flaubert describes a world given over to mimetic relays, such as plants that are no longer distinguished from animals, insects that are identical to rose petals, other plants are like stones, and stones are like brains. As stalactites become breasts. This world of the hermit has been the subject of famous painting from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance to Max Ernst and Salvador Dali via Hieronymus Bosch. But in Flaubert's writing, this is more than visual and more even than tactile. The saint wants to become, the saint wants to become what he sees. I feel like flying, he says, swimming, yelping, bellowing, howling. I wonder how that's translated. <laughs> he wants to be inside everything and, quote, drift away with smells, flow like water, vibrate like sound, gleam like light, and curl myself into every shape to penetrate each atom to get down to the depths of matter, to be matter. The saint is mad, for sure. 
inflicted with the ecstasies of religion and of living alone in his cave except for his visions. His mimesis, his mimesis are also mad, but is not the world of the hermit? Back then, in the Egyptian desert, is it not our world today? Is it not our world today? With just as much a religious and magical tone, tone, for is not nature today enchanted or rather re-enchanted? Is this not obvious with our negative sacred, negatively sacred sun burning us to crisp as nature turns surreal, every day different with its ominous green, yellow coloring and fake bluer than blue skies as the snow falls one day and rises as mist the next, stripping us naked as pixies as the cosmos draws close. That's on the mimetic faculty. <laughs> My first shape today was the clouds. My second shape is here. My third shape is to emphasize trickery, deceit. Which brings me to the concept of shamanism, which I worked with quite a, quite a long time in southwest Colombia. I spent a lot of time thinking about the relationship between magic and trickery, and trickery as a mimetic art used by shamans and all sorts of people. And I thought, well, why don't I be used trickery too? And then I thought, Trickery and performance is so much of our lives and is so much of politics, so much of politics, especially since the internet, especially since 9-11, especially since the last election in the United States. And I was thinking about the head of the FBI, a nasty organization, who was removed from his job by uh, President Trump because he wouldn't stop the investigation into the Russian and uh, affairs. And uh, Comey in the New York Times said recently, how come people follow Trump uh, in the White House? Um, I, I think he put it as well as only a victim could. Someone mimetically in sync could. He quote, he's speaking of Trump, he says, speaking rapid fire with no spot for others to jump into the conversation, Mr. Trump makes everyone a co-conspirator to his preferred set of facts or delusions. I have felt it. This president building with his words a web of alternative reality and busily wrapping it around all of us in the room. And then, and then you are lost. 
He has eaten your soul. I thought, this is absolutely amazing. He has eaten your soul. This is the ex-head of the FBI. He's being dramatic. He's being rhetorical, blah, blah. Still very, very powerful idea in our modern secular age. He has eaten your soul. People think Trump is a fucking moron. He's an idiot. He's all of those things, but he's also special. And there are lots of people like him, right? And he'll, they'll eat your soul once they have the Supreme Court, once they have a majority of Republicans, and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to do is draw a relationship between the, uh, the sorcerer, if you like, these mimetic relays, and what politics is today, and a relationship between the turbulence of politics and the turbulence of the weather. That's my third uh, shape. My fifth and last shape is this. Uh, the, the, the fifth, the last shape is this. It's even got a name. It's called Julio Reyes' Phantom Ship. The Phantom Ship of Julio Reyes. All these ideas today began when I was thinking of color and heat by the Timbiki River in the forests of Western Colombia several years ago. I got the feeling that the mimetic faculty alive in all of nature, including human nature, was picking up, picking up on global meltdown, rerouting language and consciousness through the space of death, whose shadow, like the setting sun, now claims us. Poor nature, melting glaciers, polar bears adrift in warming seas, Beetles scampering like refugees north and south. Human civilization on the skids and the poor will go first. Nature was the first colony. Nature is victim, an Oxfam basket case with a pot belly and huge eyes staring at you as you evacuate, looking for a place to hide. But hang on, maybe we should turn this round. Not nature as victim, but nature stirring, fighting back, ferociously with all it's got by way of animistic impulses and mimetic sympathies, starting with your body as much as with glaciers and polar bears. It was night. I started to paint a picture of Julio, Julio Reyes' phantom boat coming slowly upriver. Just a story, you say more like a gesture, but how do you paint a spirit ship, especially when it's, quote unquote, just a story? How do you paint a spirit ship at night on the dark river, but are unable to paint the different shades of blackness charged with Nietzsche's knowing what not to know, or worse still, not knowing what not to know, beyond words? Is that why I was painting instead of writing? Or was I searching for a form and a manner of writing that was in itself painting? Or better put, cinematic. So, suited to the delirious circuitry of master of non-mastery, to the mimetic faculty in this our time of meltdown, re-enchantment, and metamorphic sublimity. Perhaps the painting, or at least the effort <laughs> therein, made it real. Not really real, but sufficiently real in that phantasmatic boat way, so that the doors of perception opened wide. Yes, here it comes tacking through the upside-down reflections of houses illuminated by kerosene lamps glowing in the blackness of a river under a moonless night. Perhaps it was more than I had bargained for, 
Perhaps it was mastery of non-mastery unwinding the shroud known as the domination of nature. You, you can switch the light on now. <clears throat> And the waters came and swept vast numbers. And the waters came and swept vast numbers of creatures through me, so that in my timbers, creature befriended creature in the gloom. That's Brecht, his poem called The Ship. As we drift now, like Julio Reyes, phantom boat in our age of meltdown, we sense something new about the idea of being connected and making connections between species as much as between language and species. The ship sinks into a watery grave, fish, sharks, giant squids, crustaceans of all sorts and seaweed waving with the currents enter and make a home, temporary as it may be. But whoa, this ship is me. I have become porous to those creatures as much as to the colors of the deep. Friends we are now, it seems. We communicate in new ways now. But nothing could better represent the shape-shifting form of the mastery of non-mastery than the voodoo light the time of cosmic gear change when light and dark slide into, over, and through each other, derealizing the world, suspending being in becoming. It comes as an accomplice, stealthily, the lovely hour that is the felon's friend, the thief's friend. I'm talking about twilight. It is the thing, well, a good part of my argument concerns the movement from daylight to night and the in-between threshold space of dusk and dawn when reality starts to change and all sorts of, to my mind, fantastic things happen. And I'll, I'm focusing on one. See, my idea of the mimetic relays and all that sort of stuff is very enhanced by the twilight and dawn. And a lot of filmmakers call that time magic hour. And they like to film at that time. This is the phantasmagoric light show called forth with increasingly flare by meltdown. So my idea of global meltdown is that it increases the light effects of twilight and dawn. In meltdown animates also birds, animals, plants and insects that awaken as the night falls. Not to mention those other creatures such as Marcel Proust in bed and James A.G. on the porch in Alabama scribbling with his pencil. Roland Barthes and Walter Benjamin did not think of non-human awakenings. They did not see the bats that suddenly fill the air. Lightning fast they are, gliding in at all angles to consume the mosquitoes that also love this voodoo light of twilight. As the fireflies, unlike the bats, exhibit much calm as they make their entrance as the nature theater of magic hour begins. Fireflies essentially define the word magic. And as for bats, do they not come loaded with frightening associations and hence recall Karl Marx, whose words are like bat, said Vilfredo Pareto. His words are like bats, being both birds and mice. Such a zoomorphic view of language could be taken further when thinking of 
the uh, bodily components of twilight as a multi-species affair, a dissolution as much as a stalking, praying, and why not? A grand ballet and procession of spectacular forms that slide through, if not actually mimic, the chameleon properties of voodoo light. Add to the bats and fireflies the following crepuscular beings, ocelots, jaguars, rats, skunks, moose, wallabies, wombats, nighthawks, owls, and flies along with a host of beetles that come out with twilight. And here comes, here comes Hegel's owl of Minerva spreading its wings in flight, a wise bird, this owl, claiming you only see things for what they are after sunset. Some of these creatures restrict their awakening to twilight proper, while others extend into the night, especially if there is a moon. And all these animals, of course, are exercised by climate change. It's not that you see different, it's that your body sees different at these times of day, even if you don't realize it, other than other things that I won't go into right here. But is this what lies in store for us with global meltdown, this curious accentuation of consciousness like shamanic trickery, revealing only to conceal, not so much beyond language as amplifying its fire-flying potentials. Far from being a pathology consequent to meltdown, is this actually a device meltdown provides for a decisive breakthrough into the mastery of non-mastery. I'm trying to equate the fluctuant forms of, of twilight with a state of consciousness which, to my mind, would facilitate a completely different way of relating to reality, to other species and things. The problem of consciousness, wrote Nietzsche in The Gay Science, first confronts us when we begin to realize, get this, when, how much we can do without it. The problem of consciousness first confronts us when we begin to realize how much we can do without it. And he goes on, all of life would be possible without, as it were, seeing oneself in the mirror. Whoa. The thinking which becomes conscious, he says, quote, is only the smallest part of it. The thinking which becomes consciousness, he says, is the smallest part of it. Let's say the shallowest, worst part, for only that conscious thinking takes place in words. This is a very radical attack on consciousness and language. It's all very well and good to be sensitive to the difficulties, yet also the delights with language, as Nietzsche so obviously experiences and practices throughout his work. But this harsh condemnation seems willfully angry and obtuse. It's like an inspired last gasp of language in its death throes, hating on itself, lovingly. He's using this beautiful language to say that language <laughs> is bullshit. It's all well and good to resort to such cliches as embodied thought, like so many writers on this topic do. But what Nietzsche expresses, I was going to say has in mind, is not thought, but something else, which I dare to say is closely tied to a movement of thought, rather than thought itself. It is a movement that cancels itself out in a peculiar and fascinating way emerging from and disappearing back into the body. Such a body, 
involves a good deal more than what I call my body. Rather, it is my body, your body, and the body of the world. What I refer to as the bodily unconscious is thus multiple and effervescent, which is what, makes, which is what now makes language a delightful burden. The trick forced upon us, I think, by meltdown is how to write without words, or should I say, with words that act like those magical spells, those evanescent spells spoken softly into things to activate their glow, their speed, their love. We can agree with Nietzsche about language only if we recognize that there are many sorts of language, of writing, of talking, and singing, and humming, whispering too, in which words engage with my body, your body, and the body of the world in waves of mimetic impulsion with the dead and the yet to come not to mention that peculiar property of voice, the notion of voice in writing. Have you found your voice yet? You, someone might ask a writer. Is this got you, your body in it? Some people find it very quick, other people never do. It's the sort of writing that you might find evoking heat and color in the writing of a diary. Quote, fires had been kindled in a few places, marvelous spectacle. Red, sometimes purple flames had crawled up the hill in narrow ribbons through the dark blue or sapphire smoke, the hillside changes color like black opal under the glint of its polished surface. From the hillside in front of us, the fire went down into the valley, eating at the tall, strong grass, roaring like a hurricane of light and heat it came straight towards us, the wind behind it, whispering, whipping, sorry, whipping half-burned bits into the air. Birds and crickets fly past in clouds. I walked right into the flames. Marvelous. Some completely mad catastrophe running straight on at me with furious speed. <laughs> That's from the diary of an anthropologist. Bronislav Malinowski, 1914. Walking into fire. Yes, that's us for sure. This is how I see us today, us fire walkers, limping behind our fireflies, faced with the re-enchantment of the sun in the age of meltdown, roaring like a hurricane of light and heat with birds and crickets flying past, frantic in clouds flecked with color in the turbulent slip stream. And the field work? What if this blur of bodies in flight becomes, along with heat and color, our ethnographic focus? What if the fo field worker practicing participant observation participates with the birds and the crickets flying past in colored clouds, as can happen when in an unknown land you write in your fieldwork diary, opening up that other fire called yourself. This is what happens when you take seriously all that magic the islanders have told you about, the islanders told Malinowski about. Soft murmurings of spells into things. Soft spells into things like canoe lashings to go faster and safer, speaking spells into fragrant herbs to make love magic, 
into crushed beetle nut mixed with pigment so as to make an intense red into one's skin to make it glow. What happens if the field worker participates in this magic too? Whipping prehistory into things as poetry in the present when the sub-freezing temperature shot up yesterday to early spring warmth. The snow started to melt like a blowtorch was put to it and the mist rose from the river like a shroud enveloping us all that lay around. We walked in the mountain close to sunset with the streams running high stripping off our clothes. At times we spooked ourselves disappearing into the mist like the phantoms we were. Same as happens in certain sunsets when the light turns everything purple with shots of yellow and blue raining like vapor from the far off ridge where the sun sets. The craziest thing was that every few minutes we would walk through a pocket of hot air and then a minute later walk through chill. And the craziest thing was that as with immersion in the air, in the, sorry, as, as with our immersion in the mist, so you sensed this mimetic pull into otherness of being in a torrent of imminent destruction. Tornadoes were reported further south. As was yesterday, one of those days of utter perfection, early fall, it seemed like we were living in glass, the world not real, but a picture in which we held our breath. Thank you. <laughs>